Well, thanks very much, and um, thanks everyone for staying to listen. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to be here. So, yeah. I have uh, nothing to declare. Um, so, so I'm going to be speaking about uh, cancer genetics, breast cancer susceptibility in particular, um, although a lot of what I could I'm going to say could apply to a number of other cancers. I'll touch on a little bit of that. Um, and I guess there are kind of three reasons why one wants to study cancer genetics. Um, the first reason is it's interesting. Um, but the more practical reasons are sort of twofold. Um, we, we hope to be able to um, improve uh, treatment and diagnosis and prevention partly by risk prediction, and I guess that's more of the focus of this meeting, uh, and I'll say something about that. Um, but in the long term, probably the more important way in which cancer genetics will be important is in terms of understanding cancer biology. And I'll touch a little bit on that. So the starting point for, the, uh, for, for all this research really is the, 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 um, uh, the well-known observation going back hundreds of years that um, uh, cancers, particularly breast cancer, are to some extent familial. Um, that is that the disease um, is about twice as common in the immediate relatives of patients, their mothers and sisters and daughters, than it is in the general population. Um, a bit more so at younger ages, the familial risk goes up a bit higher, um, lower at older ages, uh, and you've got a higher risk if you have more than one affected relative. Um, and we believe from a lot of different studies, including twin studies, that, that the reasons behind this are um, to do with inherited susceptibility. Um, so family history on its own is a useful marker of risk, but it would be much more, more useful if you could understand the genes that underlie it. Um, and indeed some of that is known, and most importantly, we know of some genes which confer high risks of the, the disease when mutated, most importantly BRCA1 and BRCA2, which were identified a decade and a half ago. And those genes are, of course, the, the mainstay of, of, um, of cancer genetics. The, these are um, um, uh, mutations, and these genes are important to identify in, in um, individuals with a strong family history, and the management of individuals, um, women who are at um, high risk by virtue of carrying these mutations is, is quite well worked out, um, um, usually through prophylactic surgery, oophorectomy, mastectomy, um, and now through MRI screening. Um, so, so that's good, um, except for the fact that um, mutations in these genes are quite rare. So although they, they confer high risks, they don't explain very much of the disease. And only about um, 15 to 20 percent of the familial component of breast cancer is actually accounted for by these high-risk genes. So the main question is, what underlies the rest, and can you get a handle on it? Um, we know now, I think, that there aren't any further high-risk genes to find, or if there are, they're very rare. And so the notion which has de be been developed is the idea that um, mostly breast cancer and other cancer susceptibility is polygenic. That is, it's due to the combination of many genes, each of which confers a relatively small risk of the disease, but taken together gives you a distribution of risk um, from people who are at relatively low risk to people who are at relatively high risk. Um, so individuals who have inherited many low-risk alleles are at low risk. Individuals who have inherited many high-risk alleles are at high risk. And most women are in, in somewhere in the middle, with BRC1 and BRCA2 mutations being up here. Um, and it turns out that the width of this distribution is quite substantial, more than a hundredfold um, range in risk across, across the distribution. So if one can identify the the variants that underlie this distribution, you would be in, a, in good shape to actually um, to, uh, to target preventative strategies. So where do we stand? Well, um, it's useful to think about um, the known breast cancer loci um, on a graph like this, where the, the y-axis here is risk, expressed as relative risk, and the x-axis is frequency, the, the population frequency. 
So on the, up in the top left-hand corner here, you have the known high-risk genes, the ones we already knew about through, through family-based studies. They confer a high risk, but they're not very common, so they don't explain much of the disease burden. But there are other things. Um, we also know of some more moderate risk genes. Um, these, are, these are genes in the DNA repair pathway, like CHECK2 and ATM, where there are mutations which confer a somewhat more moderate risk, about a two-fold risk of the disease. Um, and there are probably a lot more of these because DNA se high-throughput sequencing is still relatively in its infancy. Um, What's been of particular interest over the last few years, though, is what about down here? What about variants which um, are common in the population and confer a more, a more moderate risk of the disease? If we could find them, um, then these could be, account for a much higher proportion of the overall burden of the disease. And we have a technology for now for identifying those that was mentioned um, in the previous talk. That's Genome-Wide Association Studies, or GWAS. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, um, it is a technology for um, testing um, polymorphism SNPs across the whole genome, usually several hundred thousand, um, in a single experiment using an array. Um, and this allows us to basically assay almost all the common variation in the genome in one go. So the idea is that one tests these SNPs on large series of patients and controls and looks for differences in frequency. Um, and then, because you're testing a very large number of polymorphisms, you also need a large replication series in order to be clear that you've identified real associations. And this works, uh, and it works for breast cancer, and it works for all the other common cancers that it's been tried on. There are more than 100 different cancer susceptibility low so that have been found this way. Um, so here's an example for, of one of the biggest studies for breast cancer. So on the left here, you have this Manhattan plot, which gives the, the genome, the chromosomes along the x-axis, and here's the p-values um, going up on the, the y-axis, and you can see some big peaks here like this one on chromosome 10. Uh, and then here you have what's called a QQ plot. So this is just a distribution of the test statistics. If nothing was going on, it would look like this. But you can see here at the top end, there's a huge excess of significant associations. So now to replicate these associations, and one thing to make clear here is you have to do these studies on a very large scale because the effects of these polymorphisms are generally quite weak. So for us, the large scale comes through this consortium called the Breast Cancer Association Consortium, which currently consists of about 55 studies worldwide and about 150,000 samples. This gives us a very reliable basis for trying to identify these associations um, and define them. So here's the is the best example. So this is the top hit for breast cancer as a, a common variant, which is a, a, a polymorphism um, in intron 2 of FGFR2. Um, and it's very reliably associated with breast cancer risk. Um, for anybody who's a skeptic, there have been something like well over 50 studies, and all of them show an association with an overall odds ratio of about 1.25 if you're a heterozygote and about 1.5 to 1.6 if you're a homozygote. So absolutely clear association. That's the best one. So for, for breast cancer, currently there are about 20 well-established susceptibility loci, um, which are indicated here through a number of different studies conducted by ourselves and others. Um, all of them, except one so far, are completely distinct to breast cancer. There are a whole series of other hits for um, other cancers, but they don't overlap with the breast cancer hits apart from one, um, which I may come back to in a minute. Um, and here's a summary of these hits um, expressed in terms of um, uh, the risk. So here's a list of the loci, sometimes a gene name. Sometimes we don't know what the gene is. In fact, usually we don't know what the gene is. Here's the SNP. Here's the frequency in the population. And you can see that these are all common variants. And here's the odds ratio. So the common variants conferring a relatively modest odds ratio. 
the two most important ones are the FGFR2 variant I mentioned um, and TOX3, which is a, a gene we know much less about. Um, and that, that they confer risks of more than 1.2 fold per allele, and then the other risks are all relatively much smaller. Um, and then on the right hand side here, you've got an estimate here of what proportion of the overall familial risk of breast cancer is accounted for by each of these variants. And so far, we think we've accounted for about another 8% of familial breast cancer. So what do all these loci do? So this is the biology part, and the, the honest answer is that we don't really know for the most part. Um, we know something about um, some of the, the loci, for example, FGFR2, and indeed a, a series of the, at least a subset of the loci, do seem to form part of this common pathway, um, which is the MEC pathway. Um, uh, so, for example, um, MAP3K1 is another of the loci in this, in this pathway. So some of this um, seems to be through this um, um, growth factor signaling pathway. Um, but the, other, the general message seems to be that a lot of different things involved. So there are some loci involved in cell cycle control. Um, there are some transcription factors um, and so forth. There's a new, new locus here, which we'll come back to in a minute, which is... Um, a BRCA1 interacting protein, uh, and so forth. And in addition, in addition to loci that are near genes, there are some that are not cl particularly close to genes at all in what, what are sometimes termed gene deserts, um, where there are no genes at all within the, the, the LD block defined by the SNP. The most famous one of these is the, the, the 8Q24 region, which is also involved in a whole series of other cancers, including prostate cancer, though not the same SNP. And that, that appears to be related to long-range control of MIC um, uh, by mechanisms which are still being uh, worked through. Um, I said we don't know much about which genes are involved, and in still less do we know exactly which variant is yet the causal variant. The only one example so far where we are fairly certain we do know what the, the actual causative variant is, is again FGFR2. Um, so a series of fine mapping experiments which we did um, pin, led us down to eventually to a, a, a small number of SNPs, about six, um, from, which w uh, from which one was identified as particularly significant. So this is a SNP which is associated, clearly associated with disease in all populations, Europeans, um, East Asians, and Africans. Um, and it turns out, sorry, this doesn't come out very well in this slide, it's got mangled a bit, but uh, this SNP um, has a lot going for it. It's, it's, it's in a region which is conserved um, and is in a region of open chromatin, which is consistent with um, being available for transcription factor binding, um, and indeed some functional experiments um, done by people at the Cambridge CRI indicated that this variant differentially binds um, this, um, uh, this um, transcri transcription factor OX1. Um, so we're, a whole series of experiments lead one to suspect that this probably is the functional variant, and it probably operates, and it's known also to be associated with FGFR2 expression. So it's, a, it's a, um, operating by controlling FGFR2 expression levels. Um, this is a I'm allowed a little um, change of um, emphasis for a moment shifting off of breast cancer. Um, it's often said that um, it's not clear where what GWAS are actually delivering in terms of something that might be um, useful clinically, um, leaving aside the risk prediction, which we'll come back to. Um, but here's an example where it has, I think, led to something which is of um, more immediate significance. Um, so this is a locus for prostate cancer, which has come out of the GWAS. Uh, and it turns out that this SNP, which is very highly associated, one of the, one of the strongest loci for prostate cancer, uh, is just upstream um, of this gene MSMB. So MSMB, which was previously known, um, but this has certainly given a lot of impetus to, um, so MSMB... Um, it's a secreted protein, um, uh, and this SNP um, is strongly associated with MSMB levels, um, 
uh, and the MSMB is strongly expressed in the prostate but lost in the tumor, so the, the, the MSMB appears to have a, some sort of tumor suppressor activity. Uh, and the fact it's secreted leads to the um, potential for using this as a biomarker. Um, and there are antibodies that are available to, to, to test this and a number of studies already undergo, uh, ongoing to try and um, use this in epidemiological studies. So hopefully something like this will also turn up for, for breast cancer as we go forward. Now what about risk prediction? So um, there's been a lot of interest in this area. To what extent can you use SNPs for risk prediction? Um, well, it's pretty clear that if you take an individual SNP, um, it's not going to be very predictive. So here's FGFR2 again, our, 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 our strongest SNP for breast cancer. Uh, and your risk, if you're a if you're a, um, a heterozygote, is about 1.2-fold raised, and if you're a homozygote, it's about 1.6-fold raised. But if you convert that into absolute risks, you can see it's not a very big range of risks, from, from about 1 in 11 to about 1 in 7. So nobody's going to have a test for that. The real question is, what about combining all these SNPs together? And to do that, you first have got to understand something about how they might combine. Um, so um, we've done various analyses in the consortium to try and work this out. Um, and the general pattern is that the effects appear to multiply. That's, there's very little evidence for interactions in a statistical sense between the loci. Um, so you can more or less think of these as being independent markers of risk that you multiply together. Um, and given that, you can then define risk scores based on the, the SNPs that you have. Um, by combining the, the SNPs, effectively adding them together, um, weighted by the risks that they confer. And so you can, define, you can place everybody on a risk score from the lowest risk to the highest risk. And that's sort of illustrated here. And you can estimate the odds ratios associated with each of those categories. And you're going to, if, you, if you define the risks here going from the bottom 1% of the population to the top 1%, you can see there's a, a nice continuous oops, range of risks going up by just over fourfold. Okay. Or expressed um, in a different way compared with the, the population average, the lowest 1% has a risk a bit less than half the population risk and the top 1% a bit more than twice the population risk. So the take-home message here is that the SNPs are predictive, but not all that predictive. Um, of course, this is, this is still only about what you get with family history or some other risk factors. It's certainly not a big enough risk to be considering the sort of interventions that you consider for BRCA1 or BRCA2 carriers. It might be interesting for chemo prevention. And it might be interesting for chain modulating exactly how um, mammographic screening is um, uh, regulated in the population, for example, changing the age of mammographic screening, but it's certainly not going to be involve any drastic interventions at this stage. So you can look at that in a different way, so it's in terms of ROC curves. Um, so so this, cur this here is the um, current effect of the SNPs, so I cannot glass, I can read them. Um, so the area under the curve for the current SNPs is about 0.59, and that's actually about the same um, as the current standard set of risk factors, so things like parity and benign breast disease that are implemented, for example, in the Gale model. And it's also about the same, uh, or a bit less, than what you can get using mammographic breast density, which is another major risk factor. If you put all those three things together, you can do better, as one would expect. The green line here is what one potentially might do if you could identify all the variants underlying the susceptibility. So then you could probably get up to about 0.8 and somewhat higher if you also included um, the other risk factors in breast density. So there is potential here for a good, for, for a much better predictive um, test, but we're certainly a long way short of that at the moment. Um, how we're going to get there? Well, we need to find some more variants, clearly. Um, uh, so this is a sort of cumulative tally of how much of the familial risk we've been getting by 
uh, increasing the number of variants. So we're now up to, this was up to about 18, and we're still going up. So the big question is how high will this go um, as bigger and better studies and sequencing um, become available? Um, now, one thing I've ad omitted to, to speak about yet, but is clearly important, is that um, breast cancer, of course, can be subclassified um, in ways that are important clinically and epidemiologically. And most importantly, um, it's important to distinguish between um, receptor positive, ER positive, or PR positive disease, and ER or PR negative disease. Um, and that turns out to be a very crucial a distinction when one comes to talk about SNPs, um, because if you can see here, here's here all the, the loci that we've described, sorry, um, down here, and here you have the effects for ER positive disease in the consortium studies, and here you have the effect for ER negative disease. And you can see immediately that the effects are much bigger generally for ER positive disease um, and often weak um, or absent for ER negative disease. Um, so, for example, FGFR2 here, the, almost the whole effect is for ER-positive disease. There are some exceptions. TOX3 appears to confer risks for both disease. Uh, and then this is an interesting one, this, this locus near ESR1, which actually is predominantly an ER-negative disease uh, association. So there is a clear heterogeneity here, uh, which is important to take into account. Um, and that leads on to another um, topic which is of great interest, which is how do the, these common variants relate to the rare variants? What happens to the risk if you're already at high risk by virtue of carrying a, a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation? Because we know that these risks do vary. Um, so BRCA1 carriers, on average, have a risk of about 65% by age 70. That's mainly ER negative disease. Um, whereas BRCA2 carriers have a somewhat lower risk, but that's mostly ER positive and some ER negative disease. So what are the effects of these SNPs on the risk to carriers? Now, we've been able to answer that using another consortium uh, called SIMBA, which operates on rather similar lines to the BCAC, um, involves something over 25,000 carriers. Um, and the results in a, in a nutshell are summarized here. So here are the SNPs again, and here are their effects, their, their, their relative risks in BRCA1 carriers and in BRCA2 carriers. And now you can see here that, generally speaking, in BRCA1 carriers, they don't have much effect. There are just four here that have an effect. In BRCA2 carriers, however, many more have an effect. Um, and in fact, the pattern is almost identical to what one sees for ER negative disease and ER positive disease. So what that's saying is that the reason that these, um, low, these SNPs don't have any effects in, ER, in BRCA1 carriers is because they're operating, um, uh, BRCA1 carriers only get more or less, um, usually get ER negative disease. Um, uh, and so the SNPs don't have any effect, whereas they do modify the risk for ER positive disease and hence modify the risk in BRCA2 carriers. Um, uh, and here's one just um, particular example which is quite interesting which sort of illustrates why it's important to consider subtypes. This is a, the recent results of a, of a GWAS in BRCA1 carriers. Uh, and this study identified a new locus um, on chromosome 19 which is close to this gene Merit 40 which is a BRCA1 interacting protein. Um, and the interesting observation here, uh, there are t actually two SNPs, um, but you see an association here in BRCA1 carriers, um, and then when you look in the general population, you see an association for ER negative disease, but for ER positive disease, actually you see an association in the opposite direction. So if you don't have the subtyping, these effects cancel out and you miss it completely. Um, now, the, the fact that, the, that a lot of these SNPs modify the risk uh, in carriers could be important clinically much more, um, much more immediately than the general population because the absolute risk in carriers is much bigger. Um, so a small relative risk in a carrier has a much bigger absolute effect. So if you take the BRCA2 examples where the effects are more clear, here is the 
um, the cumulative lifetime risk of breast cancer um, in a BRCA2 carrier goes up to um, around about 50% by age 70. And here um, are some examples of how that risk might be modified by the SNP. So um, if you take this red line here, this is somebody who's at on the 95th percentile of the risk distribution. Um, and you can see it's, it's a significant change. They're now up to something like a 70% risk, whereas if you're on the 5% percentile, you're down to less than a 40% risk. Um, so you can see here that and as more SNPs are identified, you're going to get to um, potentially substantial differences in absolute risk that may be important clinically. So to finish off then, so here, um, here we, we now have a, a, a sort of um, a bigger um, compendium of breast cancer loci that's growing all the time. So we have the high risk loci, um, some more moderate risk loci, um, which there are some more here that now that are, I haven't put on yet, and this growing list of common susceptibility variants. What's left to find? Still something like um, 70% of the familial risk hasn't been accounted for. How are we going to find this so-called dark matter that's missing? Well, it depends a bit what, what's there, and there's a lot of debate in the literature about what's still to find. Um, there are probably a lot more common variants to find, and that's going to require um, ongoing studies, larger scans, um, combined scans, and bigger follow-up studies. A lot of that's already ongoing. However, if there are many more rare variants, then we're going to require different technology, um, either more complete genotyping arrays um, or next generation sequencing on a large scale, and some of that's beginning as well. And then there are some other possibilities, structural rearrangements may be important, uh, and there may be more complex interactions that we haven't yet um, identified. So some conclusions to finish. Um, so, GWAS have been very successful at identifying many cancer predisposition loci. Uh, however, in most cases, the causal variants underlying these associations are not yet known. So there's a lot of biology still to uncover. Um, the remaining familial risk that we haven't yet identified is probably due to some combination um, between rare and common variants. The risks associated with common variants tend to be subtype specific, especially there seem to be a big difference between ER positive and ER negative disease. One thing I haven't had time to discuss, but the low size that we've identified so far don't seem particularly to be related to clinical pro progression or survival, but there's ongoing work to try and find those. Um, the loci, to the extent that they interact, they seem to interact in a multiplicative sense with each other and also, which I also didn't have time to discuss, with um, other lifestyle risk factors. Um, and at the take-home message, I would say that at the moment, risk prediction using SNPs is not that useful um, clinically, except in, um, in combination with other risk factors that make some individuals at high risk um, in combination. So I'd like to finish there. Firstly, just to acknowledge people um, at home in Cambridge uh, and in the UK, and also the, um, my collaborators throughout the world, um, here pictured in Australia, um, in the Breast Cancer Association Consortium, the Simba Consortium, uh, and the fundings. So thanks very much. Thank you, Doug, for that very comprehensive review of genetic variants in breast cancer. So we're right up against the 5.15 hour here, and uh, so I'm going to call this session to a close. Again, I want to thank all the presenters and all of the audience for hanging in there, and uh, I'm going to hand the floor now over to Eva, I guess, for uh, Dr. Gruppin's presentation. Okay. Thank you, everyone.